43 as the Delaware lead, 327 remaining. And Sean Locke into the game. He's going to get a career high in minutes if he plays the remainder of this basketball game. He scored against Michigan State in the NCAA tournament. Good start in Delaware. Chance to get your first and we were there. Cross for a pass. Locke squares, fires, and hits. Plus one. Sean Locke with the biggest play of the night. I met Sean July 7th of 2013. It was my first day on campus. We all went to his house that evening after we met, and he said, hey, you're on the team, your family, we look after each other, and he was just telling me what to, what to think, what to think about college, how to adjust. And that's when I knew, I was like, this is a really good kid. He was funny, he was fun to be around, like he was just a good guy. Um, and you could just tell that just by meeting him Ralph the first time. We're um, about to go through this four hour long scouting report. Four hour long scouting report. What's up, what's up, Sean? We're about to do work, all right? Work, all right? I'll get back to you at lunchtime. Bye. He was a uh, unbelievable kid. Um, he was extremely kind and caring. He was a kid that walked into the room and everybody was just happy to see him. What are you all fired up about? About to get this win. He had a smile. You, know, you hear about the million dollar smile, and he definitely had one of those. Sean Locke had a lot to smile about. He was the brother of seven, homecoming king and a star athlete in the state of Delaware. I kind of always thought that Sean's everyone's best friend, and I'm sure everyone says this, but Sean is my real best friend. We were so similar. We had so much of the same tendencies of being able to go and like work a crowd or know how to make someone laugh. He was everything you could want in a person. He was a shoulder to cry on, and he also knew how to cheer you up. Sean was selfless. He was a team player not just in his family, but in his school and also on his sports teams. Sean was a seven-time All-Star for the Elkton Little League, where he also won a state championship. He excelled on the basketball court too, becoming the first freshman to start on the varsity squad at St. Mark's High School in Newark, Delaware. First time I met Sean, he was a rising ninth grader and we were short guys that night. He just came up to me and said, hey, Coach, I'm going to St. Mark's. I'd love to come out and play summer league and help you guys out. Looks like you're a little short-handed tonight. And he was fearless from the get-go. I mean, maybe a minute or two into the game, he's, he's pulling up, shooting shots, and he really had a confidence about him right from the get-go. He just had that attitude that, hey, I, I want to be the best, and he was the life of, uh, life of the school. I mean, he was the lifeblood of that school for four years. After graduating from St. Mark's, Sean walked on to the basketball program right down the road at the University of Delaware. I was already at Syracuse, and so he would reach out to me because he was thinking about, do I go lower Division I, do I go Division II basketball? I remember he messaged me back and was like, hey, I'm going to be a walker on the University of Delaware. And I was like, hey, man, that's an awesome choice. You're going to love it. Prior to his arrival, the Blue Hens had been reeling from several losing seasons. They were a team with a desperate need for help. I was convinced he's the right type of kid we wanted for our program at Delaware. He's everything you want in a teammate. And he battled adversity early in his career, not only in high school, but early in his career at Delaware in terms of injuries. But every day he showed up and competed. To be a walk-on at a high-level program, it's tough. You're asked to do the dirty work in practice. You're asked to stay late and rebound with guys. You're asked to do a lot of different things that the scholarship guys maybe aren't asked to do. I knew that he could do all those things and that his coaches were going to love him. Although he was a walk-on, Sean brought invaluable leadership to the program. He was unbelievable in the locker room. He was a huge leader. Sean was the kind of guy where you asked him to do something and he would do it. It wouldn't be why or is there anyone else that could do it. And I think that really spread to other players. In Sean's first year as a Blue Hen, Delaware finished the season recording the most wins in 12 years narrowly missing the conference championship game. His sophomore year, Delaware advanced to the NCAA tournament for the first time since 1999. 
the Blue Legs win their first ever CAA championship. 75, 74, Delaware wins it over William and Mary. Although Sean was not the biggest star on the court, he found his role as a trusted voice in the locker room. You know, when Sean spoke, especially as he got older, junior year and senior year, everybody listened. Sean graduated from Delaware with a bachelor's degree in business administration with a minor in sports management. He went on to work for the Buccini Pullen Group in their commercial real estate department. I mean, Sean was liked by everybody. He was a good looking young man had a great job, excited about working for Buccini Poland. Sean was like the most popular man in the state. If you hung out with Sean, you, you, you were cool with everyone because Delaware is a state where everyone knows everyone. So you go around and say, hey, I know Sean or I'm, I'm on Sean's team. You're like, oh, you know Sean Locke? On the outside, Sean had it all. But on the inside, Sean was suffering from the crushing weight of anxiety and depression. I, I never would have ever guessed that that's how he was feeling. You really can't tell what someone's dealing with inside. I mean, a lot of people are really good at hiding it. He is a great example of that. On July 18th, 2018, friends and family received the phone calls nobody ever wants to get. Hearing the news, they never thought they'd hear. I was actually in the process of moving and uh, just had gotten home. I was at my friend's house. I was at home. I was on the road recruiting. I was at um, the doctor's. I got a phone call from my mom. You know, I was busy at the time, I didn't pick up. And uh, she sent me a text, that said, call me ASAP. Mr. Locke had called me. I remember it was, it was on Wednesday night. It was a little weird because it was a little late in the evening. It was around 9, 10 o'clock. So I was like, okay, what's Mr. Locke calling me for like this late? You could just hear the pain in his voice. He was hysterically crying, and so I couldn't comprehend what he was saying at first. You could tell that something was seriously wrong. I picked up, and it was the um, EMT on the phone, and she said, um, Kevin, uh, you know, this is, this is the EMT. I'm here with your mom. Your mom asked me to call you. Um, your brother, Sean, has passed away. After years of battling anxiety and depression, Sean took his life. He was 23. I like never cry. That's like my superpower, I guess. But um, that was tough. When you're a big sister, you wanna like protect everyone. I was willing to do like whatever it took as Sean's older sister, but like calling my dad and telling him that Sean killed himself was something that I never thought I'd have to do for Sean. I've dealt with suicide professionally and personally, and I can tell you it is the worst pain that any mom or parent could have. And it is the last 911 call any mother or RN ever wants to make on her own son. As the news of Sean's passing circulated, family and friends were left in shock. It's not the call I was expecting, by any means. Sean and I spoke probably three weeks before he passed. He was as good as I remember talking to him. It was one of those things, it's like, is this really, is this really happening right now? I think everybody says it until it happens, but I would say, you know, if you gave me a list of people, then Sean would have been the last person I probably would have picked. Yeah, you, know, you always worry about them when they get their license. And then you worry when they go off to college, you know, what trouble they gotta get into. But we had gone through all that. He'd gone through unscathed in high school, and he had gone unscathed through college. And you question yourself as a father, and you question your own purpose in life. What was it all for? And then you go through a phase of being very angry. How could he do this to us? But then you, know, you start looking for answers. 
You're never going to find the total answers, but you know, Sean left us a very brief note. And he said, I love my family, I love my friends, I'm so sorry. Depression is a real thing. And that was the first time that I knew he had depression. He was so good at hiding it. It's not that, you know, when people are hiding depression that they're not telling an authentic story. It's just harder during that moment. Um, but I guess I spent a lot of time thinking about, like, how could I have created a better space to listen more? And I think that's something I try to do, is listen more. Sean and I had had a conversation the day before. Um, he left work early, and he came and he sat in a chair all day here and just stared at the TV. And he didn't even say hi when he came in, which is so unusual for Sean. And he said, um, I'm, uh, I'm so anxious. And I said, about what? And I sat on the bed with him for 20 minutes and we just talked and, you know, he was distressed, but I had no idea. I was the one person that had a chance to help him. I knew then what I know now, you know. I, um, I feel like I let him slip through my fingers. After Sean's passing, it became his family's mission to raise awareness about mental health. In his spirit, they created the SL24 Foundation with the goal of doing just that. I was at his viewing and his parents and, and his dad especially, they were so shocked as everyone else was, but he, he kept speaking about awareness and, and, and only if there was something out there that kind of got this conversation of mental health going. I kept just thinking of how Sean helped me kind of get a job here and I was just thinking of a way of, of how I could help. Not long after, Trevor Cooney, a Syracuse men's basketball alumnus who had played in two Final Fours, began organizing a basketball event with much more meaning. Sports is something that brings us together as a community and as a whole. I had this job here at the 76ers Fieldhouse, tied in with sports. Can I bring mental health to people with sports? Thus, the creation of the SL24 Memorial Classic, a high school basketball showcase. No one wants to talk about mental health. Like, no one wants to talk about depression. It's not something that's fun to talk about, but sports are fun to talk about. <laughs> if you were to do a PowerPoint on mental health, are you going to get everyone's attention? You're going to get some people's attention. But if you put a basketball game out there, are you going to get people's attention? Yeah, you are. So that was the whole idea behind this event, this basketball showcase. You have some high school teams playing it, and you promote mental health. And you get people to talk about mental health without them even knowing about it. On February 8, 2019, thousands attended the SL24 Classic to not only see great high school basketball, but to start the conversation about mental health. Yeah, that was a, um, a very amazing night in one sense because you saw a community come together to really start to have an honest conversation about depression. And I had a young man said, because of that night I told my friends I had depression. And it started the conversation to get him the help that he needed. You realized how much of an impact mental health has on everyone. And no one wanted to talk about it, but here we are talking about it. And we had coaches and players and, and school and people, alumni, reach out to us saying thank you. Like, hey, my kid brought it up at the dinner table. My kid did this and, and he did that because of this event or because of what you guys are doing. I think this is what Sean would have wanted to be memorialized as, something living and breathing and gritty and imperfect in the way that high school basketball games are. The SL24 Classic raised over $200,000 in its first year. In addition, it gave attendees an opportunity to see another, younger lock on the court. It was really cool that he got to play a lot during the tournament. You could tell that everyone was super excited because they all came onto the court. Watching Aiden at that game was insane. I know that Sean would have just been over the moon proud of Aiden. He would have been the first one to like run down on the court and lift him up. 
Mr. Locke, before the two varsity games, he came out and talked. Um, we had the mic and, and we dimmed the lights in here and he said, uh, everyone please pull out your cell phones. If you have depression or you know someone that's battling depression, turn on your, your flashlight on your phone. Shine your light right now. Stand up. Your light may be the very light to help those suffering out of the darkness of depression. What I really hope comes from Sean's passing is that people realize that mental health is a huge issue in the world. Everybody has a story, so this is nothing to be ashamed of. It doesn't discriminate based on race, it doesn't discriminate based on socioeconomic status, it doesn't discriminate based on anything, and it's real. It doesn't matter if you're super rich, if you're super poor. Everyone has their struggles, and everyone's struggles are different, and you, you just gotta, you gotta face them, and, and hopefully there's a safe haven for people to go talk to other people that can help them get help. With the money raised by the foundation, SL24 plans to create that safe haven. Opening in September 2020, Sean's House will provide a location for high school and college students to receive professional help. I think a very important piece of mental health is um, you have to want the help. You have to seek it out yourself. And that's the hardest, hardest step. Go to a school counselor, go to your school nurse, but don't just do nothing. No mother or parent should ever have to bury their child. And if there's anything that I can do to say or prevent that, that is why I'm here today. We need to really have a really honest conversation about mental health and really not be afraid of it. When you're asking people to stand up if they have depression, stand up if they have anxiety, stand up if they lost someone to suicide, you're asking for a really human moment. And they all stood up and they all took their phones out and they all had their lights. And for 10 seconds, it was just completely silent, just filled with light. You just got chills. It was one of those out of body experiences where you could see the whole thing and still be there because everyone was together in something that most people feel alone in. When you saw those lights, I felt like Sean was shining his light down on all of us. And he's probably going, okay, let's get going. Let's push through.